Hey there, fourth trimester listeners. Our program today is proudly sponsored by Family Album, your secure haven for sharing baby photos and videos. Head over to the App Store today, search Family Album, one word, download the app, and start creating a legacy of love, one photo at a time. Hi, I'm Sarah Trott, and welcome to the Fourth Trimester Podcast. I'm a new mama, and this podcast is all about postpartum care for the first few months following birth, the time period also known as the Fourth Trimester. My postpartum doula, Esther Gallagher, is my co-host. She's a mother, grandmother, perinatal educator, birth and postpartum care provider. Fourth Trimester Care, our topic, is about the practical, emotional, and social support parents and baby require. And importantly, it helps set the tone for the continuing journey of parenting. Hi again, listeners. It's Esther Gallagher. Uh, Sarah's not with us for this podcast, sadly, but uh, she will be on the next one, I'll betcha. Um, I'm here today with Z and Jeanette from Our Family Coalition, and we'll be talking about... um, their uh, involvement with this wonderful organization and um, how it serves them and their community. But I'd like to start off by reminding you all that we have the option for you to subscribe to us. We have a newsletter, fourthtrimesterpodcast.com. You can go and get this information. You can... uh, friend us on Facebook and all that other crazy social media stuff. And you can also go to our Patreon page and help sponsor us. (laughs) Sarah and I do all of this out of our own pockets and hearts, and we're thrilled to be able to do that. But um, there are some costs that we're not going to be able to sustain for long. So anyway, hope you're all having a great day. And I'm going to have our wonderful guests reintroduce themselves and tell us a little bit about who they are and really spark your curiosity about some stuff that I feel uh, is super important. And I'm so thrilled to have them on the podcast today. So Z, why don't we start with you? Tell us your story about becoming a mom and your community and how you were led to OFC. Sure. I'm Z Wen, and I am a mother of two. I have a toddler who is a little bit over two years old and a four-month-old, so that's pretty new. I'm a, I identify as a queer, um, we identify as a queer family, so my wife and I got married in 2013, but we've been together May, this month actually will be um, eight years Congratulations. together. Congratulations. Thank you. And before meeting her, I didn't really sort of have a idea of wanting a family or baby. So it's definitely um, wrapped up in falling in love with um, with my wife. So we always knew um, part of the falling in love with each other was sort of this vision of um, having a family together. And um, it took us a few years to sort of get into the right place with our um careers and our relationship um and then when we went down this road you know we had to really figure it out so as a queer couple it you know it's a sort of it's a very different process um than it may be for um straight couples um we had to figure out where do we get the sperm who's gonna carry it how are we gonna do this how are we going to pay for this um and And then, you know, sort of as we went down the path, it was a lot of other questions sort of came up, like what um, what does family look like for us um, as a queer couple and um, as as a two people who want to raise our family in a very, very um, expensive town like San Francisco, where we don't have any uh, blood relatives around. Um, And I I grew up with, my mom has 10 brothers and sisters, so I had a lot of cousins, and I grew up where multiple families lived in one house, Um, so that was definitely something I thought 
family was supposed to be as. So going from that to a very nuclear family was, um, imagining that was hard. So we had a, a lot to figure out. Um, so, you know, I hope I can sort of go in a little bit more detail about that today. Um, but maybe Jeanette, <laughs> you can introduce yourself first. Okay, great. <laughs> sure. Um, so I'm Jeanette Page. I'm a family programs coordinator at our family coalition. Um, and our family coalition is a nonprofit organization. We're located in San Francisco, but we do events and programs and work throughout the Bay and also do policy work throughout the state, if not sometimes nationally. Um, my work is really around um, working directly with LGBTQ parents and their kids. And so I help coordinate um, parent-child play groups, support groups, parenting classes. Um, and we also plan some really fun larger events. We do um, pride events, which are, we're kind of in the midst of planning right now. So that's where my head is. <laughs> um, and personally, I came to OFC um, really randomly. So I've been on staff about a year and um, prior to that, I was working for about 10 years doing sexual assault prevention work um, and was feeling like I needed a change. Um, I, I personally identify as queer. Um, and so when I sort of stumbled upon our family coalition, I was like, wow, that's so cool. I've never seen anything that does that before. Mm -hmm. um, I've never seen an LGBT organization that actually focuses on families, mm -hmm. on queer families. Um, and so when I saw the job posting, I was like, wow, I want to work here. I want to be involved in this. Um, and it's actually, it allowed me to connect uh, different pieces of my personal and professional work experience all in one position. Mm -hmm. So working directly with people, doing direct service, um, doing social justice related work, because working with queer and trans people means um, we have to engage with social justice and we have to engage with um, anti-oppression work. Um, and I grew up in a home that was a uh, daycare run out of our house. So <laughs> I, that's handy. <laughs> so I've actually been able to go back to my mom a lot with this job and say, how did you deal with parents in this situation? Or how did you set up your, you know, childcare space? Um, so it's, it's been really fun and interesting to me to be able to put all of that together and to get to work in a cool place like mm -hmm. our family coalition and with awesome families like Z's family. You guys and are a godsend <laughs> in terms of family supports. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. That's so great. Maybe if you don't mind talking a little bit more about when you and your wife are actually ready to go out and find sperm because you had to do that, right? Mm -hmm. That process, insemination was part of the process. Mm -hmm. These are all details that I think, you know, hetero couples never have to think about until, unless and until they have fertility issues, right? Mm -hmm. Right. And so, uh, or so-called fertility issues, like that's a whole nother ball of wax. But um, so... Maybe you can talk both about um, maybe your journey a little bit and then how our family coalition may have been able to offer um, support or maybe even there was a, a, uh, um, a way that you came to our family to further and broaden the ways in which they could do their work. So I know you're involved in the organization directly. And so uh, that's kind of a wide open question. <laughs> Sorry. I will try to answer all parts. Okay, great. Um, yeah, you know, as a queer family, we have, um, it sort of, I see it as a burden and a luxury, the, the luxury to really create, be intentional in creating our family because we can't just, whoops, yeah. you know, <laughs> accidentally have a child. Mm -hmm. um, it takes a lot of intention um, to, to create our family. So I, I find that 
that I think that's a really good thing. So we have, you know, as queer families, we have to, we really have to be ready and want to be parents. Um, and the burden part then is like, is the actual creation and, and going through that process. So for me and my wife, we, I had this very, um, specific idea that of this queer family structure so we have no you know male counterpart because we're not in a heterosexual relationship um and so we could have chosen to just go to a sperm bank and i think Mm -hmm. that's sort of the the um often when people think about you know two women having children or or you know we go to a sperm bank and it's that image of ellen Mm -hmm. yeah you know, right. with that box and yeah. what was yeah. that movie? Um, if these walls could talk. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and well, not only that, but that you just do that. Right. That is somehow simple. Right. Mm. And it's not. And it's even not. that is, I mean, sperm's expensive, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't know how much it is now, but, you know, I was, I think we were paying almost $900 a pop and that's for one vial, one shot, to, to try it. And mm-hmm. if it doesn't work that one month, then you got to do it again the next month. Mm-hmm. Um, and actually we didn't, we didn't end up doing that. Um, or we didn't at first want to do sort of the sperm bank, um, and getting our sperm that way. We actually wanted, um, to meet somebody who would be sort of part of our family. Mm-hmm. Um, not necessarily rights and things like that, but more like um, in the queer community, we call them like a, a dunkle, a donor uncle. <laughs> um, so we wanted something like that, a dunkle. Mm-hmm. Because I wanted my children to have some sort of male figure in our lives. I didn't want to sort of erase that completely. And when questions came up of like, you know, on the play yard, like, you know, you have two moms, but where's your dad? Mm-hmm. Um, I wanted them to be able to say, you know, I don't have a, fa- a dad, a father, but, you know, I have my uncles or, you mm-hmm. know, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Um, and plus, I knew that creating a family required more than just a mom, a dad or two moms or two dads. Um, that it is it takes it really takes a village to build a family mm-hmm. and to survive <laughs> as a family. Um, and so I loved, and again, I came from um, a family with a lot of people, a lot of aunts and uncles and cousins. And, you know, I was, somebody was always picking me up from school. It wasn't always my mom. She always worked or, you know, I would hang out at this person's house or that person's house. Or we shared the responsibility of the children or they shared the responsibility of the children together. And so that's what I always imagined. And so that's what I wanted. I wanted something that was a um, less conventional structure of the nuclear family um, because I knew like it's really it's hard work I watched my mom do it and and for a big chunk of it she was a single mother mm-hmm. um, and so we we tried I mean we tried um, a couple of, you know a friend um, and it didn't we didn't actually we tried approaching a friend yeah. um, and it didn't work out I mean it was a very it's a huge responsibility and I appreciate our friend for um, really taking the time to think it through and saying like I don't know if I'm ready for that responsibility um, I would have loved you know um, our family coalition does a uh, egg meat sperm mm-hmm. <laughs> and that wasn't around then I mean this was only three years ago or I didn't know about it then Mm -hmm. um and that was that would have been it's an event a mixer where um it's exactly how it sounds right like (laughs) women and men and everything everybody in between who might want to be looking to create a family Mm -hmm. in a different kind of structure Mm because it isn't always like a coupled, whether that's again straight couple, gay couple, or queer couple situation, um, I would have, you know, yeah. definitely sort of checked that out to see whether it worked out. But so our our sort of friend's choice, and as we went down the that road together, it didn't work out for us. Um, but we know a lot of families where it does work out, where there's a friend who donates, um, and then is part of the, the kid's life as as the child grows up. Um, we randomly, we needed a plan B as we were waiting for our friends to, to think about whether to be the donor. 
Um, and so we just did a random search and the first person we found happens to have the same ethnic background as my wife, um, half white and half Italian, half, half Asian. Um, and it was just like the person just, he had the same birthday and birth well, yeah, as birth month and birth amazing. year as her, his dad was a special ed teacher. I'm a special ed teacher. So it was like these little weird things where like, oh, this is the guy. <laughs> and we were like this. We called him Plan B. <laughs> Not nice. Plan B. Um, and then Plan B just ended up being Plan A. And it was, it's great. I mean, we have two beautiful, beautiful children. Um, I was really, really lucky um we both we're both civil servants as a teacher and my wife is a police officer so um our insurance covered it being in the bay area um they covered the insemination um which would have cost like two or three thousand dollars per try it mm -hmm. took us four tries with our first child mm -hmm. um and then i was really lucky with the second one just one try um and we just had to pay for the sperm but mm -hmm. um you know, I have so many, so many friends who had to go through all so, so many different rounds. IV, multiple rounds of IVF, donor sperm, donor eggs, um, you know, friends who just used other friends, mm -hmm. at home inseminations, in house inseminations, midwife inseminations. Mm -hmm. um, there's so many different ways to make a family. Yeah. yeah. So many different ways to make a family. I'm so happy you're naming you know, just listing yeah. all those ways, because I think honestly, you know, the average person out there who might be right in the thick of the same issues you mm -hmm. had three years ago, mm -hmm. or how old is your daughter, your older? She, she's um, a little bit over two. Now. Yeah. yeah. You know, um, they'd be starting from zero. Mm -hmm. They would maybe have no idea of the options. Mm -hmm. So if they knew of one thing, they would head in that direction. But gosh, hearing that there's such a thing as midwifery, you know, midwife insemination mm -hmm. might really appeal to them or... And it's actually and, it's cheaper than, than yeah. going to Kaiser. Like we went to Kaiser yeah. and had a doctor do the insemination, but... Yeah, and Kaiser's probably cheap. Yeah. <laughs> Compar you know, right. I mean, compared mm -hmm. to so many other yeah. possibilities. So, yeah, um, thank you for, for making that list. Um, years ago... Um, uh, when I first moved here and was doing postpartum care through uh, a little woman-owned agency called the Fourth Trimester, <laughs> which doesn't exist anymore, uh, but was really wonderful. I'm so happy I sort of had my my beginning beginning years of of being a postpartum doula with them because they were so supportive in in many ways. But I. I expressed as you know a particular interest with the owners that uh, whenever there was an opportunity to go to any kind of offering out in the world here in San Francisco that was directed um, about helping uh, LGBTQ uh, folks make family that I would really like to go mm -hmm. learn and perhaps support, you know, uh, represent the fourth trimester. And um, gosh, I, I just feel so lucky. I mean, I live right down the street from the women's building and mm -hmm. the events were always there. So it was really convenient, but, um, but there's just, you know, so much of what you're talking about now has been evolving over those many years. I mean, that was 25 years ago, mm -hmm. right? So the insemination of so many <laughs> things you're talking about really started a long time ago. But as I say about so many things having to do with family making, each time somebody decides they want to have a child or gets pregnant, as it were, it's as though they have to reinvent the wheel mm -hmm. because <laughs> somehow when it comes to making family in this culture, it's not something we all know all about. Mm -hmm. We're, it's as though we're kept in the dark until we, you know, have Make to do it. And course. then we have to figure out how, <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm always thrilled when these sorts of resources can be more widely <laughs> kind of broadcast and people can, can learn about them, that they do exist. Mm -hmm. You don't have to start from scratch. 
Um, you know, there are entities that will help you navigate a little bit when it comes to all this. That's really wonderful that you're mentioning that. Um, And the blessing of things like technology, like podcasts and social media is like being able to connect with other people who are going through mm -hmm. the things that you're going through. I mean, I, so part of our story is, is um, as we were trying to figure out this whole process, we joined a group called Baby Buds, um, which is, was a mostly queer conception group. So it was like a conception support group. Oh, brilliant. Um, and we learned, and it was just random. I was friends with a woman who was friends with another woman and connected <laughs> us through Facebook. And then we, you know, they... They um, knew the founder of the Baby Buds sort of group. And I think we were Baby Buds six or something. So we were like the sixth sort of group to come together. Um, and that was a huge, that was a model of support that I had never seen before. And I, you know, I think they tried to do a Baby Buds seven. I mean, I really hope that yeah, they keep sort going. of do... Keep I'll see if I can track like them that. down to, for the podcast. Yeah. Yeah, for That's sure. Great. That we would love to have some, some um, folks like that. And yeah, we were, I think there was a, I can't remember. I, I want to say maybe there were six or seven of us. Um, it started bigger and then sort of some, some of it whittled down and then it was just sort of a core group. But even as we were a bigger group, all of us were in sort of some, some of these places of, of conception, right. Mm -hmm. Of figuring out conception and, there was so much collective knowledge in the room mm -hmm. um, that it was just beautiful. This mm -hmm. is, it's exactly what we needed to do as a society, mm -hmm. right? Like mm -hmm. if, if our society wasn't the way that it was, it was more sort of, you know, I don't know, before sort of civilization times, um, we would be our mothers and our fathers and you know everybody would teach it would be integrated as part of our culture right. to family how to build family and oral history right and how to support each other through a variety of um you know whether that's like infertility type type things but it's just not the case and you do have to take you know you have to work to put this together but it's there and there are and I think there are people with things like Facebook, people want to be connected. People want to build those support structures. Mm -hmm. um, and then you can find it, whether you're here in San Francisco, where we have all of these resources and we have a wonderful organization like Our Family Coalition, or you're in, you know, another place where you might think that you're the only queer people, couple in that small little town and... You might you know, be surprised. <laughs> you might be surprised. And you might just, it might be a quick sort of Facebook little mm -hmm. connection and finding other families nearby. Even other families that just accept that you're queer and are right, happy right. to, you know, support yeah. you yeah. would be a, better than feeling all alone. Oh, right. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Um, I want to ask you uh, a question uh, from this perspective, so as you know, I'm a birth and postpartum doula. I've been doing it for a long time in the Bay Area and, and um, in my earlier life as well, some midwifery work. And um, over the years, I've worked with handfuls of uh, lesbian and gay and other identified uh, families. But from your perspective, Z especially, um, if you were looking into the community and thought, gosh, it'd be great to have a birth doula or, and or a postpartum doula. Our family could really use some care that understands these transitions mm -hmm. from every angle. Um, what would you be saying to upcoming doulas, say, mm -hmm. um, that would be really special if they understood when they come to support your family mm -hmm. so that you're not explaining. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I recognize that as I was coming up, um, you know, I was in a situation where every now and then I needed some explaining, mm -hmm. right? Some, you know, graciously, the families I was working with could give me some perspective on this or that, mm -hmm. right? I wasn't a complete dummy. 
you know, and I'm very, very, uh, um, you know, wide open, um, and very much motivated to work, um, with our community in this way, but I still needed some explaining and, and, um, if I could have saved those families, those moments of explanation, mm-hmm. I would happily, mm-hmm. you know, if they could just assume that I already knew. Mm-hmm. So um, from your vantage point, what are a couple of things that would be just really handy for support people? It doesn't have to be dualist, right? Yeah. But but let's say you're, you're um, non-queer friends or family want to show up and they've said, we want to show up and help you. Mm -hmm. Right. Like the rest of the podcast addresses a lot of stuff, as you may know, like how to be helpful and what not to do. (laughs) But what would you like to add to that list of do's and don'ts? (laughs) Um, I think, I think, you know, sort of thinking about, um, if I was thinking about, you know, for the most part, you know, our friends have been, our friends are either queer or the ones that are not, like, have been in the city or been, Mm -hmm. like, around enough queer folks to sort of, you know, how to navigate certain things. But sort of thinking about, thinking outside of that, like, the, if, if you weren't, if you didn't have a lot of knowledge about um, our community, so how, how would you approach how how would you or how I would want a person to approach that in terms of supporting our family? Um, I think the you know first would be um, probably you know sort of respecting um, gender identities, sort of not sort of making assumptions about who might be the birth mom or who isn't. So Mm -hmm. one of the things that happens a lot is um, I may have given birth to the children, but whenever Jen is holding the children or holding the baby or something, then people are talking to us, then people assume she is the birth mother. Mm -hmm. Or oftentimes because of the way that we look sort of gender wise, um, I look more feminine, um, and she sort of has more of that sort of stereotypical masculine kind of look, then people assume I'm the birth mom because of how mm-hmm. I'm gendered. And, you know, they, they put us in these um, heteronormative sort of boxes. Like, mm-hmm. you look like this, you're sort of the man role. You like look like this, you're sort of the female role. Mm-hmm. Um, and those are, you know, still slight assumptions make a big difference Mm -hmm. in how somebody may talk to a queer couple. Um, So like I can imagine as a postpartum doula, um, they, if, if you weren't there right for the birth or something like that, Mm -hmm. then you might sort of come meet, you know, meet a couple and um, make an assumption and address a person, you know, as they, some, you know, assuming, that person is the birth mother or whatnot. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, sort of those little uncomfortable situations, Mm -hmm. you know, suck for us. (laughs) Like it doesn't feel... (laughs) They're not small. Right. Yeah. They're they're not small for us, exactly. Mm -hmm. Um, It doesn't feel good. So a lot of people might... um, I mean, that's just a a wonderful um, thing for everyone in the world to understand, Mm -hmm. right? Like Mm -hmm. we need... you know, whatever relief it might be in uh, all kinds of differently sort of identified, as it were, families, Mm -hmm. if we could release some of the tension of what Mm -hmm. strict gender roles are about, right? Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, there are queer families where one of the partners is a female to male, Mm -hmm. right? Right. And, and it, it, they may be fine with being identified as quote unquote the man in the right. relationship. Mm-hmm. And they might not. Mm-hmm. Like there's why would you assume right. based on how they look? So and and not only that, can you even assume based right. on right. How, how they look to you? Mm-hmm. you right. Can. There's I mean, so many things about that. And yeah. and um in my fantasy world, even fairly uh 
so-called normative identified heterosexual couples, like what a relief it could be to any number of men, mm-hmm. right, to not have their dad role so tightly identified oh, yeah. in terms of how they care for their children. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's very... It's so common. gender sort of expectations are very strong in our society. Hey, fellow parents, can we take a moment to reflect on the joyous chaos that is parenthood? You know those days when our hearts swell with love at the sight of our little ones and we're bursting at the seams to share every adorable moment with the world. But let's be real. Some things are better kept in the family, and your loved ones who matter the most aren't always close by, and they might not be that tech savvy either. So how can you easily share your baby's beautiful growth with loved ones while keeping your precious memories secure? I remember the frustration of trying to use some of the big tech photo solutions, only to find they fell short of what I needed. That's when I stumbled upon something truly remarkable, the Family Album Map. The Family Album Map was created to give parents a secure and easy way to share photos and videos with loved ones. It's an orderly and totally secure haven for your family's personal memories. I love that there's no third-party ads, no unwanted eyes, unlimited storage, and that it's totally free. So to all the parents who are out there still trying to use other messaging apps for your kids' photos, it's time to level up your family photo game with a free photo sharing app. Head over to the App Store today, search Family Album, one word, Download the app and start creating a legacy of love one photo at a time. Especially Mm -hmm. around children and around family building. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that's when we really notice like gender binary, Mm -hmm. gender roles, Mm -hmm. and how we start putting that on kids before they're even born. Mm -hmm. First question Um, is always, is it a boy or a girl? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, Yeah. I mean, well, and we get it even in the queer community. Mm-hmm. I get yeah. a lot of that as well. And I think this is being out right beyond there's my baby. <laughs> well, and I will just say from the perspective of postpartum care um, and maybe from the perspective of a twice single mother, I think the assumptions that go along with who needs what and what kind of care and support in families based on this strict identity of gender roles is crushing families, Mm -hmm. any family of any community and identity. Um, The assumption that you don't do certain things um, because you're the man that you could be doing Mm -hmm. and that could be supportive of your family um, and that all of those jobs land on somebody else because they have breasts mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that can lack, like, right. ugh, it's so crushing. And it's just, it's confusing for queer and trans couples um, or queer and trans parents because, um, like, you know, there may be two cisgender, like, women partners, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and one could give birth and then the other one could potentially be lactating and Absolutely. nursing, right? Yes. And so if you see someone Work nursing a kid, mm-hmm. it doesn't necessarily mean they're the person who gave birth. And so mm-hmm. um, I think when we're stepping away or from gender binary... if they didn't give birth, they shouldn't be breastfeeding. Right, exactly. Right? Yes. Yeah. Um, Any number of exactly. possibilities there. Yes. It, it just kind of opens up things for people. Um, I think a lot of people see our family coalition. I know working there, myself, my colleagues, we come to our family coalition we're like whoa this really blows things wide open for us Mm -hmm. in terms of what's possible Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of people don't think of lgbtq people as like potentially having families Mm -hmm. um and that that's like mind-blowing for people in 2018 Mm -hmm. um it, it creates a lot of possibility and i think one of the reasons is because like we don't do our programming in a gender binary way yeah um we can't, it wouldn't work, but also, <laughs> yes, um, <laughs> the average out pretty quick, yeah. <laughs> but also, it's um, it's harmful, it's harmful to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, you're right, it harms cisgender straight people too, yeah. Um, you know, we've had conversations in our programs about trans dads mm-hmm. who are they'll think really hard about whether or not they want to carry like they have the capacity to get Mm -hmm. pregnant Mm -hmm. yeah um but just the way they might be treated by society um 
Hi, Enzo. <laughs> Hi, Enzo. Um, the way they might get treated by people on the street or even by their, their family and friends, um, it makes them question mm -hmm. how they would want to approach whether or not they'd want to be pregnant, whether or not they'd sure. want to have family in that way. Yeah. Um, and I think that's a shame. I think that that shouldn't be a factor in whether or not people um, decide to become a parent or Absolutely. decide to pursue parenthood. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's... Um, I mean, the world would just be so much more fun and interesting. Let's face it. Right. It would be. <laughs> you know, if 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 uh, if what we are con what we consider normative was so much wider. <laughs> right. Yeah. I'm waiting for it. Yeah. And better for kids too. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. I mean, giving kids the. I mean, that's the biggest. Kids learn the best from sort of role models and seeing. Mm -hmm. The, the wide possibilities of yeah. family structures and, you know, I'm loving, I feel really grateful to sort of be in this time period of um, history in terms of, you know, I can, I buy all sorts of books and um, I think I went uh, of that show structure families, dif different family structures, mm -hmm. some that look are like ours and some that are even different from ours, um, anything from, having two moms to two dads to single parents and adoptive, you know, family mm -hmm. structures. Mm -hmm. um, and I get to read those books with my kids and they know that it's like a, a you know, they know it's a, it's families come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And it's so great to be able to teach them that, that yeah. there are, there is literature that's, that they're reflected in, that their their family structures are reflected in, um, other family structures are reflected mm -hmm. in. So, you know, I've, I feel you know, very grateful that we at least you know we're go we're moving in that direction. Yeah, I I will say as somebody who would probably be considered a cisgender heterosexual identified woman, I've been a single mom twice, and if I'd known <laughs> that there was a possibility of raising my kids with a queer couple mm -hmm. yeah. I would have jumped at it yeah. I really would have because I honestly am somebody who uh doesn't want to be in a in a normative relationship like mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. I'm not interested in a nuclear family style mm -hmm. of doing things yep. it didn't it didn't work for me anyway mm -hmm. uh whatever attempt was ever made in that direction mm -hmm. wasn't how I could do things and um gosh if the possibilities had been wider I wanted to have kids I, you know I'm thrilled that I have my two children but they needed better support. Mm -hmm. They deserve better support mm -hmm. than they got. Probably needed the support and too. I needed a different kind of support mm -hmm. that wasn't um, defined by a heterosexist society, right. for sure. Yeah. You know, yeah. mm -hmm. um, where everything falls on one one mother who's mm -hmm. supposedly the person who gave birth to these children, mm -hmm. and. Um, that you're supposed to do it all on your own and you're supposed to be completely thrilled about it. Yeah. <laughs> you're supposed to be so happy. Right? <laughs> Nothing's ever wrong because <laughs> this is the yeah. epitome of your yes. life. No matter what. Right. right. No matter your socioeconomic yeah. cir circumstances. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, so, yeah, as you can tell, like, I'm always thrilled when there's just more resource, whatever forms of resource they are for whatever kinds of families there can be. Um, I'm so happy to get to hear about it. And I'm so thrilled you could come. Um, Z, tell us about your offering at Community Well. Yeah. So, I mean, part of um, my process in this family building was um, coming to this place where I realized I don't have any, you know, sort of blood relatives around and I needed to build my own family structure here. Um, and so building community became my sort of my thing. Um, you know, I had, like I said, I had such a hard time sort of letting that go and, um, and find, you know, a lot of crying nights of like, we're going to have to do this all by ourselves. <laughs> um, and then I only yes. laugh because I know what you feel like. Right. <laughs> yeah. And then I was like, no, you know, I sort of kicked into gear and, and 
just sort of became a, um, just started seeking it out. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, like I said, I joined this, um, conception group, which was helped us sort of build on our community together. So some of us did, um, uh, got pregnant and have kids like all around in the same, the same age. And then some of us, um, so some of us continued our friendships and our kids are friends and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Um, and one, one of the couples started a group, um, at community well for queer families, because it, it is a different structure where when you get together with other queer families, there are things that you don't have to, you know, navigate. Like, yeah. Right. Sort yeah. of explain. And there's a level of comfort, um, in being around, you know, other families that, and our kids to see other families that look like our family. Mm -hmm. um, so that was very important. And it was, and I, I just, so we do a monthly meetup. Um, and I ended up taking, taking over the, the group to run it. We do a monthly meetup the first Saturday of the month um, at Community Well on Ocean Avenue. Um, and it's great. You know, we have new families that show up and it's the small, it's, you know, I hope it's been sort of a model of the older fam, the families who have older children can sort of help the new families in terms of, oh, your baby's doing this, like, it's okay, it's a phase, like, here, you can try, you know, this or this, or this is what really worked with my kid. Um, and I really try to push um, families to figure out other families who live in the neighborhood and just continue outside of the one month meetup. Mm -hmm. um, so in conjunction to that, and it's an OFC sponsored, we also, they all, we also have a um, queer family hike. So sort of mm -hmm. oh, doing that fun. once a month as yeah. well. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I've just sort of connected with other families who are in our group, but live in the neighborhood um, to just do play dates. Like, mm -hmm. My my fam my the support system I have now that I sort of really worked to create is so broad now that I can call on other families and we would do things like date night swaps. So mm -hmm. I drop my kid off at their house, you know, one week, and the next week they drop their kid and go on a date night, um, and not you know have to spend uh, you know, you know hundred dollars on a on a babysitter or something like that, um, and just simple things like that. Um, mm -hmm. Even now, you know, I've been having, struggling with um, doing the whole two kids thing. Oh, yeah. Um, that's a whole other ball game I didn't realize. <laughs> and I've been calling on my community a lot. Mm -hmm. um, in, all, in all honesty, I am suffering from postpartum depression this time around. Mm -hmm. I didn't the first time around. Yeah. Um, and my community has been such a huge, huge support mm -hmm. in in helping helping me feel more grounded and, yeah. and getting through this time period, you know, mm -hmm. um, people, friends who are coming over at night to help out, um, or coming over with their kids just so my toddler can have somebody to play with, so I can focus on my infant. Mm -hmm. um, those things are huge. They are. Um, it's and, really true. Yeah, it's huge, and 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 can be created. Yeah. Um, just you I know. Agree. It's there. <laughs> and people want, you know, people want to be in community. They do. Yeah. 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 And we know that so much of depression is the antidote is community, yeah. right? Is, mm -hmm. is breaking through a sense of isolation and, and all of that. So yeah. good for you. Good for you. I mean, there is a, there is a way through this. Yeah. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. And also it's hard. Like, I think, What's a shame is that in our society, individuals have to kind of do that on their own. Yeah. They, right? Like, Z, you had to build that mm -hmm. in for yourself. Um, and people shouldn't have to do that. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's amazing when people do. Um, and one of the things with our family coalition, um, with our family support work, that's the whole point, right, is we're trying to create more spaces um, for peer support. 
um, for building community, for sharing information with each other, whether that's like an outside, you know, quote unquote expert, <laughs> use that term lightly, um, coming in and talking about something. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll edit that out. Later. Okay. Um, or, you know, it's just people who have been through the experience sharing their own wisdom um, with people. And so, you know, that's sort of like the basic tenant around family support anyway. Um, and yeah, it's a huge protective factor against things like postpartum depression, but against so many other things too. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, our OFC really tries to be there in as many ways as we can. Um, for San Francisco, we're actually a first five funded population specific family resource center. Mm-hmm. Um, Fantastic. So that's really cool and really unique. I don't I don't know of another um, LGBTQ family resource center anywhere else in the country. Mm-hmm. Um, there are a couple other organizations that work sort of on the policy level or maybe the informational educational level around um, LGBTQ family building, but. Um, the fact that we do that and we do direct service is pretty unique. That's so great. And how do um, folks find you? People find us in all different ways. So locally, word of mouth is huge. (laughs) Um, So word of mouth is big, um, but also people have found us through Googling. Um, We put all of our events up on Meetup. Mm -hmm. People have found us through Meetup, through Facebook, Mm -hmm. um, through, you know, other media And it's interesting because um, there's this little gap between um, maybe like support for the LGBTQ community in general, right? Um, And people might be involved with organizations or entities that provide that. And then if and when they decide, okay, I want to start a family, there's this gap around, well, okay, well, what do I do? Where do I go? who can help me with that? Where do I find this information? And then people feel like they're back at square one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, And so we do get a lot of people just like finding us because they needed us. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, We do have a website. It's ourfamily.org. So you can Google us. You can type it right in to your Mm -hmm. browser. Um, Mm -hmm. And then we're also connected through some of the other organizations like you can find us on Family Equality Council's website, I believe, because they have a listing of um, LGBTQ family groups around the country, oh, I believe. That's um, good to know. Most of them are volunteer Can you say run. that again? Um, family Equality Council, I believe they have a directory of um, mostly volunteer run LGBTQ family groups. Fantastic. Um, and so you can find us through there or you can Google us directly. Um, yeah. Family support's huge. It's a big deal. Mm -hmm. And even if it's just um, for the sake of like, I just need to be around people who are not going to treat me like the token gay Mm -hmm. (laughs) in the group or, you know, treat me like I'm strange because um, my family doesn't look like theirs or my family building journey was different than Mm -hmm. theirs was. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. Sounds fantastic. Um, Anything you'd like to add either of you, um, before we wrap up, this has just been so rich and great. So thrilled you could join us today, but, um, is there any little tidbits that we missed so Mm. far? I think I just, I just like to say it's important, um, for families, whether you are, you know, straight, gay, somewhere in between, but, (laughs) we all know how important support is. Um, And especially if you are a queer family in an area that doesn't seem to have any other queer families that um, we can, you know, I love that technology has gotten to the point where we can connect in a variety of ways. Um, And even just a simple like message board posting or listening to a podcast like this, finding other people or, you know, finding a group on Facebook um, can be Mm life-changing, can be really Um, life-changing. You don't have to feel like you're doing it alone. I think it's mentioned multiple times already. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. Like there are um, people have gone through this Mm -hmm. forever, Mm -hmm. (laughs) have built families and are, are, 
trying to make it as a family and be healthy and loving. Um, and there are other people out there who wants to be connected with you. That's lovely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think for for anyone who's listening in the Bay Area, our Family Coalition is absolutely a resource for you. Um, so if you're looking for information, for referrals, to connect with other LGBTQ families, um, or to get more in-depth support, we're here for you. Um, and for anyone who's living in the California area, <laughs> um, we're here for you too in that we do a lot of statewide policy work. Um, we're working right now on a lot of um, Fair Education Act implementation work. So helping to um, recommend LGBTQ inclusive textbooks for different um, grades and different um, areas of study. Um, we also do lots of policy work, both statewide, local, regional, um, some national. So um, the work we're doing hopefully will benefit everyone. Um, and so you can always reach out to us. If we're not in your area, we could try to connect you with someone or an organization that's closer to you. And I just want to tack on here that um, I've said often on this podcast that you know, this podcast is for everyone. Um, the subject is the fourth trimester, but everyone has who's been born <laughs> experienced the fourth trimester. And everyone who may give birth or be part of a new family is going to experience the fourth trimester. Whether you're uh, the birth mother, the partner, the cousin, the grandmother, like there will be a fourth trimester in your life again someday, um, possibly several. And just as that is true, it's also true that someone you know and love, whether you know it or not, happens also to be queer. Mm -hmm. So they may have a four trimester in their life. They will have had at least one when they were a baby. And they're very likely to have one sometime again. And so we can all learn how to be better with each other, especially during this period of family making. So I hope you enjoyed the podcast today. Um, I hope you share it with all your friends and family. I hope there are things that you'll take forward into your life uh, that you learned about today. And um, thanks so much, my guests, for coming today. Um, Z Wynn and Jeanette Page. Sorry. <laughs> it's one of my favorite names. Um, <laughs> And um, thanks, everybody, for listening. And we'll see you next time on The Four Trimester. Bye. You can subscribe to this podcast in order to hear more from us. Thank you for listening, everyone. And I hope you'll join us next time on The Fourth Trimester. The theme music on this podcast was created by Sean Trott. Hear more at soundcloud.com slash Sean Trott. Special thanks to my true loves, my husband, Ben, daughter, Penelope, and baby girl, Evelyn. Don't forget to share The Fourth Trimester podcast with any new and expecting parents. I'm Sarah Trott. Goodbye for now. Hello again. Bicycle man, I know you're doing all that you can. I wrote the song, simple and true. I wrote the song, I'll sing a song for you. You got your wheels, you got your gears. You ride around town with Alan and Fear. You got your pedals, you got your brakes. You always wear your helmet for safety's sake.
Hello again, bicycle man. I know you're doing all that you can. I wrote the song, simple and true. I wrote the song, I sing a song for you. Hello again, bicycle man. I know you're doing the best that you can. I wrote the song, simple and true. I wrote the song, I sing a song for you.